Section 9 of Reflections on the Revolution in France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reflections on the Revolution in France, and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event, in a letter intended to have been sent to a gentleman in Paris, 1790. By Edmund Burke. Section 9. To tell you the truth, my dear sir, I think the honor of our nation to be somewhat concerned in the disclaimer of the proceedings of this society of the old Jewry and the London Tavern. I have no man's proxy, I speak only from myself, when I disclaim as I do with all possible earnestness all communion with the actors in that triumph or with the admirers of it. When I assert anything else as concerning the people of England, I speak from observation not from authority, but I speak from the experience I have had in a pretty extensive and mixed communication with the inhabitants of this kingdom, of all descriptions and ranks, and after a course of attentive observation begun in early life, and continued for near forty years. I have often been astonished, considering that we are divided from you but by a slender dyke of about twenty-four miles, and that the mutual intercourse between the two countries has lately been very great, to find out how little you seem to know of us. I suspect that this is owing to your forming a judgment of this nation from certain publications which do, very erroneously, if they do at all, represent the opinions and dispositions generally prevalent in England. The vanity, restlessness, petulance, and spirit of intrigue of several petty cabals, who attempt to hide their total want of consequence in bustle and noise, and puffing and mutual quotation of each other, makes you imagine that our contemptuous neglect of their abilities is a general mark of acquiescence in their opinions. No such thing, I assure you. Because half a dozen grasshoppers under a fern make the field ring with their importune chink, whilst thousands of great cattle reposed beneath the shadow of the British oak chew the cud and are silent, pray do not imagine that those who make the noise are the only inhabitants of the field that of course they are many in number or that after all they are other than the little shrivelled meagre hopping though loud and troublesome insects of the hour i almost venture to affirm that not one in a hundred amongst us participates in the triumph of the revolution society if the king and queen of france and their children were to fall into our hands by the chance of war in the most acrimonious of all hostilities i deprecate such an event I deprecate such hostility. They would be treated with another sort of triumphal entry into London. We formerly have had a king of France in that situation. You have read how he was treated by the victor in the field, and in what manner he was afterwards received in England. Four hundred years have gone over us, but I believe we are not materially changed since that period. Thanks to our sullen resistance to innovation, thanks to the cold sluggishness of our national character, we still bear the stamp of our forefathers. We have not, as I conceive, lost the generosity and dignity of thinking of the fourteenth century, nor as yet have we subtilized ourselves into savages. We are not the converts of Rousseau, we are not the disciples of Voltaire, Helvetius has made no progress amongst us. Atheists are not our preachers, madmen are not our lawgivers, we know that we have made no discoveries, and we think that no discoveries are to be made in morality, nor many in the great principles of government, nor in the ideas of liberty, which were understood long before we were born, altogether as well as they will be, after the grave has heaped its mould upon our presumption, and the silent tomb shall have imposed its law on our pert loquacity. In England we have not yet been completely emboweled of our natural entrails we still feel within us, and we cherish and cultivate those inbred sentiments which are the faithful guardians, the active monitors of our duty, the true supporters of all liberal and manly morals. We have not been drawn and trussed, in order that we may be filled, like stuffed birds in a museum, with chaff and rags, and paltry blurred shreds of paper, about the rights of man. We preserve the whole of our feelings, still native and entire, unsophisticated by pedantry and infidelity. 
we have real hearts of flesh and blood beating in our bosoms we fear god we look up with awe to kings with affection to parliaments with duty to magistrates with reverence to priests and with respect to nobility footnote the english are i conceive misrepresented in a letter published in one of the papers by a gentleman thought to be a dissenting minister when writing to dr price of the spirit which prevails at paris he says the spirit of the people in this place has abolished all the proud distinctions which the king and nobles had usurped in their minds whether they talk of the king the noble or the priest their whole language is that of the most enlightened and liberal amongst the english if this gentleman means to confine the terms enlightened and liberal to one set of men in england it may be true it is not generally so End of footnote. why because when such ideas are brought before our minds it is natural to be so affected because all other feelings are false and spurious and tend to corrupt our minds to vitiate our primary morals to render us unfit for rational liberty and by teaching us a servile licentious and abandoned insolence to be our low sport for a few holidays to make us perfectly fit for and justly deserving of slavery through the whole course of our lives you see sir that in this enlightened age i am bold enough to confess that we are generally men of untaught feelings that instead of casting away all our old prejudices we cherish them to a very considerable degree and to take more shame to ourselves we cherish them because they are prejudices and the longer they have lasted and the more generally they have prevailed the more we cherish them we are afraid to put men to live and trade each on his own private stock of reason because we suspect that the stock in each man is small and that the individuals would do better to avail themselves of the general bank and capital of nations and of ages many of our men of speculation instead of exploding general prejudices employ their sagacity to discover the latent wisdom which prevails in them if they find what they seek and they seldom fail they think it more wise to continue the prejudice with the reason involved than to cast away the coat of prejudice and to leave nothing but the naked reason because prejudice with its reason has a motive to give action to that reason and an affection which will give it permanence prejudice is of ready application in the emergency it previously engages the mind in a steady course of wisdom and virtue and does not leave the man hesitating in the moment of decision skeptical puzzled and unresolved prejudice renders a man's virtue his habit and not a series of unconnected acts through just prejudice his duty becomes a part of his nature your literary men and your politicians and so do the whole clan of the enlightened among us essentially differ in these points they have no respect for the wisdom of others but they pay it off by a very full measure of confidence in their own with them it is a sufficient motive to destroy an old scheme of things because it is an old one as to the new they are in no sort of fear with regard to the duration of a building run up in haste because duration is no object to those who think little or nothing has been done before their time and who place all their hopes in discovery they conceive very systematically that all things which give perpetuity are mischievous and therefore they are at inexpiable war with all establishments they think that government may vary like modes of dress and with as little ill effect that there needs no principle of attachment except a sense of present conveniency to any constitution of the state they always speak as if they were of opinion that there is a singular species of compact between them and their magistrates which binds the magistrate but which has nothing reciprocal in it but that the majesty of the people has a right to dissolve it without any reason but its will their attachment to their country itself is only so far as it agrees with some of their fleeting projects it begins and ends with that scheme of polity which falls in with their momentary opinion these doctrines or rather sentiments seem prevalent with your new statesmen but they are wholly different from those on which we have always acted in this country i hear it is sometimes given out in france that what is doing among you is after the example of england 
I beg leave to affirm that scarcely anything done with you has originated from the practice or the prevalent opinions of this people, either in the act or in the spirit of the proceeding. Let me add that we are as unwilling to learn these lessons from France as we are sure that we never taught them to that nation. The cabals here who take a sort of share in your transactions as yet consist of but a handful of people. If, unfortunately, by their intrigues, their sermons, their publications, and by a confidence derived from an expected union with the councils and forces of the French nation, they should draw considerable numbers into their faction, and in consequence should seriously attempt anything here in imitation of what has been done with you, the event, I dare venture to prophesy, will be that with some trouble to their country, they will soon accomplish their own destruction. This people refused to change their law in remote ages, from respect to the infallibility of popes, and they will not now alter it from a pious implicit faith in the dogmatism of philosophers. Though the former was armed with the anathema and crusade, and though the latter should act with the libel and the lamp iron. Formerly your affairs were your own concern only. We felt for them as men, but we kept aloof from them, because we were not citizens of France. But when we see the model held up to ourselves, we must feel as Englishmen, and feeling we must provide as Englishmen. Your affairs, in spite of us, are made a part of our interest, so far, at least, as to keep at a distance your panacea, or your plague. If it be a panacea, we do not want it. We know the consequences of unnecessary physic. If it be a plague, it is such a plague that the precautions of the most severe quarantine ought to be established against it. I hear on all hands that a cabal, calling itself philosophic, receives the glory of many of the late proceedings, and that their opinions and systems are the true actuating spirit of the whole of them. I have heard of no party in England, literary or political, at any time known by such a description. It is not with you composed of those men, is it, whom the vulgar, in their blunt, homely style, commonly call atheists and infidels? If it be, I admit that we too have had writers of that description, who made some noise in their day, at present they repose in lasting oblivion. Who, born within the last forty years, has read one word of Collins, and Toland, and Tyndall, and Chubb, and Morgan, and that whole race who called themselves freethinkers? Who now reads Bolingbroke? Who ever read him through? Ask the booksellers of London what has become of all these lights of the world. In as few years their few successors will go to the family vault of all the Capulets. But whatever they were or are, with us they were and are wholly unconnected individuals. With us they kept the common nature of their kind, and were not gregarious. They never acted in corps, nor were known as a faction in the state, nor presumed to influence in that name or character, or for the purposes of such a faction, on any of our public concerns. Whether they ought so to exist, and so be permitted to act, is another question. As such cabals have not existed in England, so neither has the spirit of them had any influence in establishing the original frame of our Constitution, or in any one of the several reparations and improvements it has undergone. The whole has been done under the auspices, and is confirmed by the sanctions, of religion and piety. The whole is emanated from the simplicity of our national character, and from a sort of native plainness and directness of understanding which for a long time characterized those men who have successively obtained authority among us. This disposition still remains, at least in the great body of the people. We know, and what is better we feel inwardly, that religion is the basis of civil society, and the source of all good and of all comfort. Footnote. Sit igitur hoc ab initio persuasum quibus, Dominus esse omnium rerum ac moderatores deos, e aque quae gerantur eorum gerivi ditione ac numine, eos demque optime de genere hominum mereri, et qualis quisque sit, quid agat, quid in se admittat, qua mente, qua pietate collat religiones intueri, piorum et impiorum habere rationem. 
his enim rebus, in butai mentes haud sane ab horrebunt, ab utili et avera sententia. Cicero de legibus. End of footnote. In England we are so convinced of this, that there is no rust of superstition, with which the accumulated absurdity of the human mind might have crusted it over in the course of ages, that ninety-nine in a hundred of the people of England would not prefer to impiety. We shall never be such fools as to call in an enemy to the substance of any system to remove its corruptions, to supply its defects, or to perfect its construction. If our religious tenets should ever want a further elucidation, we shall not call on atheism to explain them. We shall not light up our temple from that unhallowed fire. It will be illuminated with other lights. It will be perfumed with other incense than the infectious stuff which is imported by the smugglers of adulterated metaphysics. If our ecclesiastical establishment should want a revision, it is not avarice or rapacity, public or private, that we shall employ for the audit or receipt or application of its consecrated revenue. Violently condemning neither the Greek nor the Armenian, nor since heats are subsided, the Roman system of religion, we prefer the Protestant, not because we think it has less of the Christian religion in it, but because, in our judgment, it has more. We are Protestants, not from indifference, but from zeal. We know, and it is our pride to know, that man is by his constitution a religious animal, that atheism is against not only our reason, but our instincts, and that it cannot prevail long. But if, in the moment of riot, and in a drunken delirium from the hot spirit drawn out of the alembic of hell, which in France is now so furiously boiling, we should uncover our nakedness by throwing off that Christian religion which has hitherto been our boast and comfort, and one great source of civilization amongst us, and among many other nations, we are apprehensive, being well aware that the mind will not endure a void, that some uncouth, pernicious, and degrading superstition might take place of it. For that reason, before we take from our establishment the natural human means of estimation, and give it up to contempt, as you have done, and in doing it have incurred the penalties you well deserve to suffer, we desire that some other may be presented to us in the place of it. We shall then form our judgment. On these ideas, instead of quarreling with establishments, as some do, who have made a philosophy and a religion of their hostility to such institutions, we cleave closely to them. We are resolved to keep an established church, an established monarchy, an established aristocracy, and an established democracy, each in the degree it exists and in no greater. I shall show you presently how much of each of these we possess. It has been the misfortune, not as these gentlemen think it, the glory, of this age, that everything is to be discussed, as if the constitution of our country were to be always a subject rather of altercation than enjoyment. For this reason, as well as for the satisfaction of those among you, if any such you have among you, who may wish to profit of examples, I venture to trouble you with a few thoughts upon each of these establishments. I do not think they were unwise in ancient Rome, who, when they wished to new-model their laws, sent commissioners to examine the best-constituted republics within their reach. First, I beg leave to speak of our church establishment, which is the first of our prejudices, not a prejudice destitute of reason, but involving it in profound and extensive wisdom. I speak of it first. It is first, and last, and midst in our minds. For taking ground on that religious system of which we are now in possession, we continue to act on the early received and uniformly continued sense of mankind. That sense not only, like a wise architect, hath built up the august fabric of states, but, like a provident proprietor, to preserve the structure from profanation and ruin as a sacred temple, purged from all the impurities of fraud and violence and injustice and tyranny, hath solemnly and forever consecrated the commonwealth and all that officiate in it. This consecration is made, that all who administer in the government of men, in which they stand in the person of God himself, should have high and worthy notions of their function and destination. 
that their hope should be full of immortality, that they should not look to the paltry pelf of the moment, nor to the temporary and transient praise of the vulgar, but to a solid permanent existence in the permanent part of their nature, and to a permanent fame and glory in the example they leave as a rich inheritance to the world. Such sublime principles ought to be infused into persons of exalted situations, and religious establishments provided that may continually revive and enforce them. Every sort of moral, every sort of civil, every sort of politic institution, aiding the rational and natural ties that connect the human understanding and affections to the divine, are not more than necessary in order to build up that wonderful structure, man, whose prerogative it is, to be in a great degree a creature of his own making, and who, when made as he ought to be made, is destined to hold no trivial place in the creation. But whenever man is put over men, as the better nature ought ever to preside, in that case, more particularly, he should as nearly as possible be approximated to his perfection. The consecration of the state by a state religious establishment is necessary also to operate with a wholesome awe upon free citizens, because in order to secure their freedom, they must enjoy some determinate portion of power. To them, therefore, a religion connected with the state, and with their duty towards it, becomes even more necessary than in such societies where the people, by the terms of their subjection, are confined to private sentiments and the management of their own family concerns. All persons possessing any portion of power ought to be strongly and awfully impressed with an idea that they act in trust, and that they are to account for their conduct in that trust to the one great master, author, and founder of society. This principle ought even to be more strongly impressed upon the minds of those who compose the collective sovereignty than upon those of single princes. Without instruments, these princes can do nothing. Whoever uses instruments, in finding helps, finds also impediments. Their power is therefore by no means complete, nor are they safe in extreme abuse. Such persons, however elevated by flattery, arrogance, and self-opinion, must be sensible that, whether covered or not by positive law, in some way or other they are accountable even here for the abuse of their trust. If they are not cut off by a rebellion of their people, they may be strangled by the very genissaires kept for their security against all other rebellion. Thus we have seen the king of France sold by his soldiers for an increase of pay. But where popular authority is absolute and unrestrained, the people have an infinitely greater, because of far better founded, confidence in their own power. They are themselves in a great measure their own instruments. They are nearer to their objects. Besides, they are less under responsibility to one of the greatest controlling powers on earth, the sense of fame and estimation. The share of infamy that is likely to fall to the lot of each individual in public acts is small indeed the operation of opinion being in the inverse ratio to the number of those who abuse power. Their own approbation of their own acts has to them the appearance of a public judgment in their favor. A perfect democracy is therefore the most shameless thing in the world. As it is the most shameless, it is also the most fearless. No man apprehends in his person that he can be made subject to punishment. Certainly the people at large never ought for as all punishments are for example towards the conservation of the people at large the people at large can never become the subject of punishment by any human hand footnote quiquid multis peccator in nultum end of footnote it is therefore of infinite importance that they should not be suffered to imagine that their will any more than that of kings is the standard of right and wrong they ought to be persuaded that they are full as little entitled and far less qualified with safety to themselves to use any arbitrary power whatsoever that therefore they are not under a false show of liberty but in truth to exercise an unnatural inverted domination tyrannically to exact from those who officiate in the state not an entire devotion to their interest which is their right but an abject submission to their occasional will
extinguishing thereby in all those who serve them all moral principle all sense of dignity all use of judgment and all consistency of character whilst by the very same process they give themselves up a proper a suitable but a most contemptible prey to the servile ambition of popular sycophants or courtly flatterers when the people have emptied themselves of all the lust of selfish will which without religion it is utterly impossible they ever should when they are conscious that they exercise and exercise perhaps in a higher link of the order of delegation the power which to be legitimate must be according to that eternal immutable law in which will and reason are the same they will be more careful how they place power in base and incapable hands in their nomination to office they will not appoint to the exercise of authority as to a pitiful job but as to a holy function not according to their sordid selfish interest nor to their wanton caprice nor to their arbitrary will but they will confer that power which any man may well tremble to give or to receive on those only in whom they may discern that predominant proportion of active virtue and wisdom taken together and fitted to the charge such as in the great and inevitable mixed mass of human imperfections and infirmities is to be found when they are habitually convinced that no evil can be acceptable either in the act or the permission to him whose essence is good they will be better able to extirpate out of the minds of all magistrates civil ecclesiastical or military anything that bears the least resemblance to a proud and lawless domination but one of the first and most leading principles on which the commonwealth and the laws are consecrated is lest the temporary possessors and life renters in it unmindful of what they have received from their ancestors or of what is due to their posterity should act as if they were the entire masters that they should not think it amongst their rights to cut off the entail or commit waste on the inheritance by destroying at their pleasure the whole original fabric of their society hazarding to leave to those who come after them a ruin instead of a habitation and teaching these successors as little to respect their contrivances as they had themselves respected the institutions of their forefathers by this unprincipled facility of changing the state as often and as much and in as many ways as there are floating fancies or fashions the whole chain and continuity of the commonwealth would be broken no one generation could link with the other men would become little better than the flies of a summer. And first of all, the science of jurisprudence, the pride of the human intellect, which, with all its defects, redundancies, and errors, is the collected reason of ages, combining the principles of original justice with the infinite variety of human concerns, as a heap of old exploded errors would be no longer studied. Personal self-sufficiency and arrogance the certain attendance upon all those who have never experienced a wisdom greater than their own would usurp the tribunal of course no certain laws establishing invariable grounds of hope and fear would keep the actions of men in a certain course or direct them to a certain end nothing stable in the modes of holding property or exercising function could form a solid ground on which any parent could speculate in the education of his offspring or in a choice for their future establishment in the world no principles would be early worked into the habits as soon as the most able instructor had completed his laborious course of institution instead of sending forth his pupil accomplished in a virtuous discipline fitted to procure him attention and respect in his place in society he would find everything altered and that he had turned out a poor creature to the contempt and derision of the world ignorant of the true grounds of estimation who would ensure a tender and delicate sense of honour to beat almost with the first pulses of the heart when no man could know what would be the test of honour in a nation continually varying the standard of its coin no part of life would retain its acquisitions barbarism with regard to science and literature unskilfulness with regard to arts and manufactures would infallibly succeed to the want of a steady education and settled principle. And thus the commonwealth itself would in a few generations crumble away, be disconnected into the dust and powder of individuality, and at length dispersed to all the winds of heaven. 
to avoid therefore the evils of inconstancy and versatility ten thousand times worse than those of obstinacy and the blindest prejudice we have consecrated the state that no man should approach to look into its defects or corruptions but with due caution that he should never dream of beginning its reformation by its subversion that he should approach to the faults of the state as to the wounds of a father with pious awe and trembling solicitude by this wise prejudice we are taught to look with horror on those children of their country who are prompt rashly to hack that aged parent in pieces and put him into the kettle of magicians in hopes that by their poisonous weeds and wild incantations they may regenerate the paternal constitution and renovate their father's life end of section nine